New York City Russia Public Policy series, which is jointly co-sponsored by the Harriman Institute at Columbia and the Jordan Center at NYU, with the generous support of the uh, Carnegie Corporation of New York providing funding for these events. It's my great pleasure today uh, to welcome back my co-host from uh, my longtime co-host in this series, but who's been off, you know, sabbaticaling and doing various things and research, uh, Alex Cooley, who will be joining me as the co-host of the event today. Uh, before I pass it to Alex to introduce our distinguished panelists here today, I just want to give you a sense of, of how this is going to proceed. Um, we've asked four panelists here today to talk about domestic support for domestic support for Russia's war on Ukraine. What we know, all of whom are doing very interesting research in this regard. I'm incredibly, uh, um, I'm very excited to be able to learn from these scholars and learn what they're learning about uh, public opinion in Russia at this time. Uh, the way this will work is we've asked each of the speakers to talk for about 10, give some opening statements about 10 minutes or so. You know, it's academic, so we'll see what happens with the or so part of it. Uh, but they will go in turn and each give their opening statements. At that point, we'll then open it up to Q&A. Um, we, because we are using the webinar format, the way that you, the audience, can participate in the Q&A, which most of you are probably familiar with right now, is to use the Q&A button. The nice part about this, though, is that you can leave your questions at any time without interrupting the speakers. So when the speakers are talking, if you want to put a question up or when they're done talking and you think after the first speaker is gone, you have a question for them, you can just throw it in the Q&A. And Alex and I will pull from them. We'll try to get to as many of the questions as we can, but we often end up by bundling them and sort of putting them together to try to get as many topics as we're able to do. Uh, we will end promptly at 1.30, so that's how long we're going for today. So thank you all of you for taking your time today to join us during lunchtime. I think the panel is going to be absolutely fascinating, and I'm going to turn it over to Alex uh, to introduce our speakers. Yeah, thanks so much, Josh. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alex Cooley, Professor of Political Science at Barnard College and a former director of the Harriman Institute, Logtime partner with Josh on the series. And the purpose of the series is to really bring uh, bring about a dialogue between um, social science research and findings and theory, especially in the realm uh, uh, of political science and public policy, and bring them to bear on sort of salient issues uh, in, in terms of what's happening um, with Russia, and especially, of course, since February 2022, uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, the topic today, I think, really exemplifies um, some of the exciting possibilities of doing this, right? Because we have four leading researchers in this area who are not only knowledgeable about sort of trends and the what of these issues uh, when it comes to sort of public opinion and researching public opinion, especially in challenging environments, but who have also uh, innovated and engaged in um, really interesting uh, sort of methods and techniques. Uh, for trying to go about uh, conducting research in authoritarian settings or the particularities of post-communist settings, which provide, I think, some interesting uh, 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 challenges. Um, so we have four speakers, and I'll just introduce them right before the speak. So first up, uh, Grigory pop Elches, who's the professor of polit politics and international affairs at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs and the Department of Politics. He's also co-director of the Princeton Workshop on Post-Communist Politics, uh, a longtime observer, uh, author of many different sort of scholarly works on public opinion in post-communist uh, countries. Gregoria, uh, welcome. The floor is yours. Uh, thanks so much uh, uh, for, for having me here. Thanks uh, for, the, for the kind introduction. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay, great. Uh, so then, let me uh, let me st uh, start with the uh, with a with a slideshow. Um, and and so I, I want to say from the outset. So this is this is co-authored work with uh, with uh, three graduate students from Princeton: Isabel De Sisto, Laura Howells, and uh, Jacob Tucker. And uh, it's uh, based on the Russia Watcher project, which. Many of you probably know, but I will I will sort of give you a little bit of a background uh, uh, just in case anyway. So uh, th this is a tracking survey that uh, uh, we've been running uh, since May 2022. Uh, we're doing online surveys uh, with uh, random device engagement. Uh, happy to talk more about the details, but uh, basically people see ads in a number of uh, of, of websites or uh, apps that they uh, that they use and. For a small encouragement, they they uh, 
that they can they, they agree to take a survey and uh, we've been doing uh, roughly 200 of these uh, respondents per, per day uh, from May 2022 till uh, June of this year. And then we got uh, an NSF grant and were able to ramp it up to uh, to 500 respondents uh, per day. So it's a, it's a pretty uh, massive uh, uh, data collection uh, effort. And so we have a series of daily questions about war support, about trust, about uh, and then include uh, certain current events. We also have embedded a bunch of uh, survey experiments, which uh, we've reported on in uh, some of our other work. Uh, I'm happy to to sort of I will refer to it a little bit today, but uh, but without getting into details on those. And you can always check our website and our uh, Twitter slash X account uh, uh, for for updates on on any of this. And so part of what 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 I, what we're trying to do with this is is to get a sense of this sort of temporal evolution of this uh, of this uh, war uh, as this war is now about to enter its third year almost. Um, both in terms of levels of, uh, of support and opposition, but also uh, we're, we're going to today talk about some uh, other aspects as well, including like economic concerns and, and threat perceptions. And the other thing that I will just show you a little bit today, but uh, uh, at this point we, we have enough data to, to be able to tell a little bit more about some of the geographic air variation as well. So just to start with what, you know, most of us, pretty much know uh, is uh, the the levels of uh, so-called uh, SMO support, right? We, we cannot ask about war support. We still have to call about to uh, ask about support for the special military operation. Here, what we do is we, we dichotomize this uh, into support versus opposition, their degrees. And I, I can show you uh, some of those uh, patterns in the q and if, if people are interested. But what we see here from May uh, uh, from May uh, 2022 until just now beginning of December, there's some ups and downs in the levels of support, but on average, uh, they're pretty close to about uh, 65% for much of the time. You can see some increases in the in sort of early 2023, uh, followed by some declines in the summer. It's been pretty steady since. Um, doesn't mean that there are no that they do not respond to uh, to short term uh, events, things like uh, the Prigozhin rebellion, for example. But these uh, these uh, responses tend to be relatively short lived for now. Um, very briefly about regional differences in this, uh, the one one might ask uh, about uh, about the heterogeneity of uh, of this. What we see here in the in blue is uh, some of the oblasts uh, that are uh, closer to to Ukraine and therefore closer to the military action and uh, and uh, so on. We see somewhat higher support, so the national average is about forty percent uh, uh, for uh, for full support, um, but not greatly higher. Uh, we see somewhat lower levels, particularly in Saint Petersburg and interestingly in Chechnya. Uh, but beyond that, uh, the the geographic variation is not massive, right? We see some slightly higher levels also in some other parts of uh, of Russia that are a little bit farther for, from the uh, from the military uh, action. Uh, one thing, and this is based on a small sample and uh, from last year, so it's not the, the most recent of data. But one question that has come up a fair bit is how Russians will respond as the number of casualties continues to rise, right? And uh, what, what we did here is we asked the question about whether uh, a friend or a relative had died, has died in the SMO, roughly nine to 10% of people say yes. Of course, there's somewhat, there are questions about what exactly counts as a friend and as a, as, as a, as a relative. But what we see here is that if anything, uh, the main difference between the, the blue and the, the orange uh, 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 bars here is that those who have lost people to the war tend to be more likely to report strong support, right? So it's a sort of rally around the flag if you've lost somebody. This does not address questions as to who has people, who, who knows people who go there. Maybe these are more patriotic people to begin with. But, but overall, this does not point towards erosion of support, right? On the question of uh, whether the SMO is successful, uh, we see pretty similar trends. Um, some increases in early 2023, then declines until about uh, uh, sort of early July. 
followed by uh, stabilization. As you can see, just under 60% of people think that uh, the SMO is successful, about 30%, just slightly under, think that it's not, and a fair number uh, uh, answer don't know, no answer. We can get back to some of this about what, what these don't know <clears throat> might mean, uh, but still there's there are no significant trends, certainly not recently in terms of uh, how people think the war is going. Uh, going back to the question of casualty uh, uh, exposure, here we see slightly different patterns. First of all, uh, unlike for war support, where the where the uh, strong supporters are a larger category than the than the sort of weak war supporters, here we see that the modal category in general is somewhat agree that the SMO is successful. And what we see though among the people who's who lost friends and uh, relatives. It seems to go down this model category, but it, that seems to come at the uh, basically go in two separate directions, right? There are some who are more likely to agree that the war is successful, and then there are others who seem to go in the other direction of uh, of somewhat disagreeing, right? Not strong disagreement, but somewhat disagree, which 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 is interesting. Um, on the question, uh, again, trying to get at ways in which Russians are uh, affected in their everyday lives uh, by, by by the war, we asked uh, a question about uh, to what extent uh, the war uh, posed a, a threat to Russian infrastructure. Uh, in this graph on the left here, uh, uh, in red, you see the people who thought that, uh, it crossed, uh, uh, that it posed a great threat or somewhat of a threat. That's somewhere in the neighborhood of 60, 65%. And as you can see, there's some blips, but there's not a, a, a massive temporal trend. Notice that this is only from this summer, though we hadn't asked that question consistently before. Um, there's maybe ever so slight increase in, in the people who don't think it's the case, but, but overall no big temporal trends. Uh, if we look at the uh, places that are closer to uh, the Ukrainian border, and therefore might be expe expected to be affected somewhat more by drone attacks, by, by other types of incursions and so on, we do see slightly higher levels, right? So this is so this is for for this is the average for Bryansk, Kursk, Belgorod, Voronezh, and uh, Rostov, right? So so for much of the summer we see levels that are about ten percent higher than for the for the, the rest of Russia, but those levels have been actually going down a fair bit uh, in the last uh, two three months, uh, while at the same time uh, the the people don't think that it's a big problem has uh, that share has gone up. If we compare this for Moscow and St. Petersburg, we see uh, basically uh, responses that are more or less in line with the national trends. It's a little bit noisier, which just reflects a smaller sample size, but uh, but no no massive differences here uh, as far as the, the threat the perceptions are concerned. Then moving on to the question of personal threats, right? So this is how uh, serious of a threat does the conflict uh, pose to you personally? What we see at the beginning of the summer was pretty much evenly split between people thought that they were uh, threatened and not. Over the last uh, three months or so, uh, we've seen a gradual increase uh, in people who think that there's not that much of a threat. Again, still about 40% of Russians uh, feel threatened, so this is not nothing, but the trend is certainly going uh, in, uh, in, in, in the wrong direction in some sense. Um, when you look at, uh, again, the, the places that are closer to the border, in the early summer, or at least in the summer, you see that those levels are significantly higher than elsewhere in Russia, but those levels of threat have also declined pretty significantly since September. Right. Uh, then comparing Moscow and St. Petersburg, here we might have expected Moscow to maybe, maybe a little bit higher, given that they've had some drone attacks there. Uh, we see this slightly compared to St. Petersburg, but overall these are the levels are not particularly high and they don't seem uh, they, they don't seem to they, there's no uh, significant uh, temporal trend here either. St. Petersburg does seem to be uh, somewhat lower than the national average which makes sense. Okay, and then finally moving on to the question of, of, of economic uh, uh, satisfaction, right much has been made uh, throughout this war about uh, about how we should think about uh, the, the Russian economy and the sanctions and so on. Here too, we see that uh, whereas in the, uh, the, so this starts in uh, in the fall of 2022, at that point, uh, uh, 
people who thought that the economic situation was uh, was was not that great outnumbered those who thought they did. Uh, in since about uh, the beginning of 2023, this has been gradually converging, and at this point, it's pretty much evenly split. Right? Among these issues, though, and we asked them about the types of issues they've experienced in the in the past month, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, variation in the sense that uh, more than half of Russians uh, uh, say that price increases are uh, a, a problem that they've experienced. Pretty much everything else from uh, shortages to labor, uh, from good shortages, labor shortages, workday increases and so on are relatively small and for the most part have been declining in, 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 since the beginning of the year. Okay, so very briefly conclusions. Uh, uh, as, as we've uh, shown, uh, the war support seems to be consistent with about 40% uh, strong supporters. Most of this is genuine. We have a separate paper. I'd be happy to talk more about it, but I don't have the time uh, here. There's about another 25% uh, who are weak supporters, and uh, th these really are quite, uh, depending on how you ask this question, these people can probably go either way, uh, a good chunk of these. We also have seen some, uh, some uh, variation in uh, regionally, especially with lower levels in St. Petersburg and Chechnya. Um, Evaluations of SMO success are more mixed in the sense that there's much less of this. Not, not that many Russians think that the war is going great, but overall the the, the evaluations are not particularly negative uh, either. Um, on threat perceptions, they're still relatively high, but they seem to be improving, at least from the perspective of, a, of the Russian regime. And they, while they are somewhat closer uh, in areas closer to Ukraine, that doesn't seem to affect uh, support for the war. Uh, economic evaluations are mixed. Uh, inflation does seem to be the key vulnerability, and it's interesting in this sense. There was a recent report in the Economist that uh, thinks that inflation is actually likely to to pick up. So this this may be something to watch. Overall, though, I have to say we don't see that much of an obvious short term vulnerability for the Russian war effort in, in the data that we have right now. Uh, the, as we've seen, the death exposure and other kinds of uh, exposure don't seem to affect uh, the support. Um, one of the things that we have seen, and again, uh, that, that's part of uh, related research, is that the Prigozhin uh, 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 de defection and uh, his statements about the war actually did affect how people think about the war and, uh, and uh, the extent to which they thought that it was successful. But of course, that ended up being relatively short-lived, as was Prigozhin, and uh, uh, and so there's there's not a there's not a very clear sense where this kind of internal criticism is likely to come from. And I'll stop with that. Uh, thank you so much, Grigory. Thank you. Both uh, fascinating and sobering work and findings there. Thanks so much for sharing those with us. Uh, our next panelist is my own colleague. Uh, Tim Fry, who's the Marshall Schulman Professor of Post-Soviet Foreign Policy at Columbia University, also former director of the Harriman Institute and seasoned observer of uh, authoritarianism, Putin's Russia, um, but also how to conduct surveys in such settings. Tim, it's wonderful to have you on as a panelist. Looking forward to your talk. Uh, thank you very much. Let me, uh, again, uh, share screen here. How, does this look okay? okay. Um, thanks a lot, Alex. And, and I think my presentation should follow on well from... Uh, can we can see, we, we like see the whole PowerPoint thing with oh, your... Okay. Oh, here we go. No want to hit. There we go. Show. Okay, got it. Um, go. So I'm going to talk about some joint work with uh, Henry Hale and John Reuter and Bryn Rosenfeld from uh, uh, Cornell University. And we're gonna focus more on whether we can believe the survey responses in Russia. Um, I certainly believe Grigo's data because it's coming from Grigo, but uh, uh, we also might want to, to, to check some of the usual um, problems with surveys. And before I start, I wanna say um, surveys are great, but they have known limitations. Uh, they don't capture subtlety and nuance very well. They capture a single snapshot in time. They capture attitudes rather than the ability to express those attitudes politically. So knowing that there's a lot of opposition in a uh, authoritarian setting uh, might not be reflected in behavior. So we know all of those problems. What we're trying to get at is whether the, um, uh, the war has changed 
our ability to interpret surveys, uh, and if so, how. And we'll, we'll look at three kinds of bias, um, which can arise from uh, the increasingly sensitive environment of, of post-war Russia. So th three ways that bias can arise most simply, um, who's willing to take the survey, um, who answers the questions, uh, and if they do answer the question, are they actually telling the truth? So you know, we have in some sense, the complement to the Russia Watcher project, where we have uh, a face-to-face -face panel survey in Russia conducted by uh, the Levada Center, and it's a nationally representative sample. Um, and we have three waves, two of which occurred in uh, September and November, December 2021 around the, the parliamentary elections. And then we have a, 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 a third wave, um, which occurred after the full-scale invasion, mostly in September and October of this year. So these data uh, are, are very fresh. So whereas uh, Grigo can capture the minute day-to-day -day, uh, uh, changes, we can kind of look from before the war uh, uh, to after the war, okay? Um, so one thing that we might be interested in knowing is whether or not the war has affected respondents' willingness to take part in the survey. So what we can do is look at survey attrition across waves. We can look at whether people who agreed to take the survey during the pre-war setting uh, then uh, declined to take the survey after the war began. Um, and this can help answer whether or not the war changed response rates. Um, and there's a lot of research done on what types of respondents are most likely to uh, uh, not take part in panel surveys over time. And so that's another thing that we'll look at is what are the determinants of who decides to leave uh, the, the panel setting. And uh, so interestingly, we find that the usual things that uh, predict attrition in uh, surveys also seem to be affecting uh, um, uh, our research as well. Um, less educated people, people who are more socially isolated, males for some reason are, are less likely to continue to take part in surveys. Uh, one thing that we found that was kind of interesting was that uh, opposition voters were less likely to leave the panel survey from the pre-war to the war setting. Uh, we suspect that this may be due to the very limited opportunities that uh, opposition voters have to express their points of view. Um, so if we look at uh, the uh, difference in those who actually who went from agreed to take part in wave one and then agreed to take part in wave two, uh, which occurred both prior to the war, we find that 71% uh, 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 completion rate. So 71% of those who took uh, 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 the first sample also took uh, the second sample. And this is pretty normal. Uh, attrition rate for this kind of research. If we look at the difference between wave two, which was prior to the war, and wave three, which was post-war, it was about 68% completion rate. So basically uh, the same thing, a little bit, uh, a, a little bit lower. Um, it's difficult to generalize this to uh, uh, all kinds of surveys, in part because the kinds of people who agreed to take part in our survey might differ from the general population although we, we don't think that's the case for a variety of reasons. So when we sum up, the same factors seem to predict attrition in the sensitive and non-sensitive sightings. The completion rates seem to be not too different, and the rates of refusal to take part seems uh, unchanged. Okay, uh, what about uh, Russians' willingness to answer potentially sensitive questions? Uh, lots of research on this uh, points in different directions. Um, some argue, some in cross-national studies find that self-censorship in higher, is higher in more autocratic countries, especially in China. Um, uh, other analysis suggests that non-response was already a problem prior to the uh, invasion. So one thing we can do is we ask the same question about Putin's approval um, in all three surveys. And we do see that after the war, um, uh, about twice as many respondents refused to answer the question or said that they don't know. 
so this suggests that non-response after the war uh, might be rising. Um, uh, we also, though, asked respondents on a 10-point scale um, how they felt, uh, whether or not they uh, supported Putin. And we find that asking the question in this way, which give respondents a lot more nuance, um, uh, suggests that that really drives down the non-response rate, um, only to about 3.5%, which is actually uh, a pretty low. And if we you know, take these two together, um, we see that you know, Putin's approval rate uh, you know, is around 72%, which is common uh, in these surveys, about 15% uh, disapprove. And again, only 13%, 13% say they don't know or refuse to answer. But in the, with this different kind of question, it goes down. We find a similar thing for um, non-response to a question about respondent support for continuing the war. Um, we find uh, in our direct question, 43% uh, of re respondents were uh, supported uh, continuing the special military operation. 34% uh, uh, did not support continuing the special military operation. And 23% said don't know. But we asked about war, war support using a much finer scale. Um, we find that the non-responses go down uh, quite dramatically. So this suggests that the way you ask the question influences a lot whether or not people are willing to respond, okay? So we've looked at whether or not people are willing to take part. We looked at whether they're uh, willing to actually answer questions, but are they telling the truth? Um, another question we would like to know the answer to. Um, and again, there, there are different views on this. Some research that I've done with colleagues from 2017 found that the support for Putin was mostly sincere in that we couldn't rule out the possibility um, using a technique I'll talk about in a second that respondents were answering the Putin approval question on, uh, honestly. Um, we've returned to this question after the war and we, we're, uh, we also find that support remains mostly sincere, but we're a lot more uncertain um, about, uh, about whether or not we're right. And I, I could talk about that. The important thing is, is that there's, you know, different views about whether, about the extent of preference of falsification that we find um, in Russia. So one thing that we did was look, uh, we asked this kind of list experiment question where we um, try to give respondents the ability to answer um, without allowing the interviewer to be able to link the respondent to answering any of these particular questions. So it gives the respondent some sense of anonymity. Um, we asked respondents, look at this list of statements and say how many of the following are, are true about you. Do not name specific statements, just tell me how many on a scale from zero to four. Uh, half of the sample randomly chosen gets the first three uh, and half of the sample gets all four. And then we can compare the, res the mean responses in those two groups. So say that three respondent, or, uh, uh, the, in the group that received Three of these questions, the average number of responses was one. And in the group that got uh, all four questions, the average number of responses was 1.2. Uh, we would suggest that 20% of respondents uh, supported the, um, the, the or answered yes to the more sensitive question. Um, so uh, if we look here, uh, um, uh, ignore the, the middle two columns. But if we look at the, on the far left, uh, the direct support for the war question, you know, we found about 43% uh, said that uh, they supported continuing the war. When we ask in the list format, it's around 38%. So uh, this is some, these are the two columns on the right. So it's somewhat smaller, but it's still not statistically different um, using a list experiment or an asking a, a, a direct question. Um, another way to think about uh, how respondents answer sensitive questions is to ask what are potentially sensitive questions uh, uh, directly. For example, we asked this question, uh, should Russia begin general mobilization of all males of draft age to increase military power in the conflict with Ukraine? Um, we found that 75% uh, um, uh, uh, opposed, either they, uh, or strongly, either somewhat opposed or strongly opposed this. 10% uh, were somewhat or strongly in favor. 
and 15% said it was uh, said don't know or it was hard to answer. Um, so this suggests that at least on the the question of general mobilization, a lot of Russians are willing to say that they uh, don't support it. Um, we also uh, asked, um, you know, this question about do you approve or not approve of the continuation of the war? And again, we found that on average, 43% uh, of Russians supported continuing the war. But then if we split the sample into those, into, uh, uh, into Putin supporters and non-Putin supporters, we find that even among Putin supporters, 53% um, uh, supported the war. Uh, 28 percent uh, opposed the war and 22 percent either refused to answer or were unsure. Um, so this kind of, uh, you know, suggests that even Putin supporters um, uh, uh, were willing to either uh, uh, say that they opposed the war or that they were unsure or refused to answer. Um, so this gives us some sense that uh, uh, um that there is some real content uh, uh, in these answers just by looking at um, uh, uh, direct answers to these questions. Uh, so let me wrap up. Um, the findings suggest that there is some preference falsification, um, uh, but it's not that small, but it's relatively small. Um, the survey non-response uh, is still driven largely by the usual suspects. Um, most, uh, but likely not all, question non-response comes from uncertainty in political views rather than in evasiveness. Uh, we think that by asking these finer grained questions, uh, you might reduce the number of non-responses. And again, I just want to uh, wrap up by saying, uh, we all recognize the limits of survey research. Um, question wordings matter a lot. Um, we need to look at multiple measures um, and not just at one question when we're looking at really complicated uh, topics like uh, support for the war. Um, we also need to use other methodologies as well. I think a lot of the focus group uh, research that's being done uh, is also fascinating and valuable. And it's important to look at complex, hard to answer questions like this using a variety of different methods. Um, substantively, uh, I think we find that war support is still significant, but it's also rather equivocal and uh, context dependent. And a lot will depend on what happens on the ground. Um, um, I was reading uh, Vasily Grossman's War and Fate um, last night, and there's a great bit where Stalin is um, uh, thinking about all of the casualties and tremendous loss of life that's taken place during uh, the war. Uh, but in the end, he justifies it by saying, uh, victors are not judged. So, uh, you know, if the war turns out quite favorable for Russia, I think we'll see uh, lots of people um, uh, uh, supporting, uh, supporting that uh, outcome. Uh, uh, that's it. Uh, I look forward to your, your questions and uh, comments. Tim, thanks so much. Also a super interesting uh, uh, method and set of findings. Uh, our next panelist is Katerina uh, Tertuchnaya, uh, Associate Professor in Comparative Politics at the Department of Politics, International Relations and Tutorial Fellow uh, at the University of Oxford. Uh, Katrina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah, great. So <clears throat> let me start by um, thanking the organizers for the opportunity to participate in the panel today. I think the evidence I will share speaks nicely and follows well from the previous two presentations in that it asks questions about support and about our ability to evaluate the responses that we receive, be it through online or offline surveys. Um, before we delve into you know, how support for the war and the invasion has uh, changed uh, since February 2020, 22, I think it's worth, you know, having a, a quick look at what public opinion looked like um, days before the invasion. So with colleagues, we had uh, fielded the second wave of the Russian election study that that team already spoke about in December 2021, and had already asked some questions about, you know, generalized support for several hypothetical scenarios. Uh, based on the evidence we had collected at the time, which was December 2021, I think the evidence was overwhelming that 
support for a hypothetical, you know, any kind of military action in Ukraine was very low. Um, just for for context, just eight percent of a survey respondents thought that Russia should send forces to fight against. Uh, Ukrainian government troops there. Only 9% of respondents thought that you know, Russia should either train or equip separatists uh, uh, to fight with the Russian arms. And again, only 6% even lower thought that Russia should approach the West as an enemy. Again, based on the evidence, um, you know, the, the conclusion and with colleagues we, we wrote about this was that if, you know, Putin was to wage a, a war and launch an invasion, it would be hard to gain the support of public opinion. I think what we had underestimated at the time was, first of all, the, the power of the Russian propaganda machine, uh, be it through media and through, you know, a new wave of uh, indoctrination through schools, school reforms. Um, but also how rapidly the public would, mood could change. And already in December 2021, we saw that what Russians did seem to share was this rhetoric about NATO being a threat to Russian interests and the need to stand up uh, to NATO, otherwise the country would be under threat. So this was December 2021. Um, shortly after Russia um, launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, uh, polling continued, and I think it gained renewed importance for, for everyone to understand what public opinion thought about the war. Um, at the same time, and Tim already discussed some of these questions, questions about public opinion, and I think not just during times of war, but also under conditions of escalating domestic repression, because this is what we saw, are exceedingly difficult to answer. Um, concerns Tim already discussed, have Russians become less willing to respond to surveys? Um, are they Have they become less willing to respond to survey questions? Are they lying to pollsters when responding to, responding to survey items are pertinent? And I think we are all collectively through different modes uh, trying to, to investigate. Um, I think some interesting questions that also came up in the previous discussion is that, you know, answers to these questions may vary or the extent of, um, you know, willingness to participate of preference for simplification may be specific to the mode of surveys that we are fielding um, in the past few months. So the invasion has seen a proliferation of survey modes, face-to-face, um, -face, uh, online, um, that Gregor described, um, others, and I'll show results from a service that we launched with Qualtrics, have moved to an online panel. So I think this is um, a question for all of us to consider. At the same time, you know, as challenging as it is to collect and analyze public opinion data at times of escalating repression, um, studying public opinion is, is indeed um, crucial and does indeed get politicized by the regime. I think um, it's it's noteworthy that uh, public opinion polls, uh, as long as they report high support for the war, um, will be picked up by the authorities in uh, February 2020. Three, um, a day after Tsiom published a poll showing overwhelming support for the war, um, Vladimir Putin came to the Federal Assembly and said, uh, look, support for the war um, is high. The Russians in their overwhelming majority have embraced um, the war effort. Um, in work that we have conducted uh, with colleagues asking about presidential approval, um, we, we discussed some of the reasons why um, dictators may want to generate such perceptions of widespread support. Um, as we have shown, perceptions of support, so how popular some items people think are or events, drive their own reported support uh, for these items. We discussed support for Vladimir Putin, but of course, in the context of of the invasion, similar dynamics may be in place. The government may try to, you know, advertise and publicize widespread support in order to gen to shift public opinion. And it's not just through polls, of course, um, you know, rallies that the authorities have organized, be it United Russia or others, such as the communists, for example, aim to achieve just that. Um, but what do we know? about support for the activities of the armed forces or support for the invasion. I think a point that both Grigo and Tim mentioned earlier is that um, responses are context but also wording specific. 
Our ability to generalize across different survey providers has been hindered by the fact that uh, different companies, different surveys, different researchers will provide different phrases or different wordings um, of the war or invasion support question. For example, Levada, and this is, you know, one, one of the most comprehensive um, time series um, evidence we have, face-to-face uh, -face surveys uh, filtered monthly, asks consistently about support for the activities of the Russian armed forces in Ukraine. Now, I think you know the qualifier, the activities of the Ran Russian armed forces is important, not just because it could hinder opposition, but also because it, it comes with um it's 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 loaded emotionally for, for respondents and expressing opposition is hard. Um but I think several several findings stand out, as others have suggested support for the war or the activities of the Russian forces has remained um, stable. There's some evidence of decline over the last few months, definitely across a majority of Russians. But also what I think is worth noting um, is the share of respondents who say that they don't know or do not want to answer to that question. This has hovered around 10% uh, over time. Um, and compared to other questions, such as support, for example, for the Russian president or support for the Russian government, it is considerably higher. So I think that alone is, is worth um, mentioning and studying even further. Uncertainty on opinions and something I think we, we can agree and something that comes up across surveys independent of how they, they are filled. At the same time, and again, going back to what um, colleagues have mentioned, um, support for the word varies depending, again, on what respondents are asked. Again, going back to Levada face-to-face -face opinion surveys, we see that um, a larger share of respondents tend to support um, the initiation of peace talks as opposed to the continuation of the Russian military, uh, of the military operation with Ukraine. And again, a sizable share of don't know respondents. This question was not asked as frequently as the support for the activities of the Russian armed forces. However, it remains um, you know, it remains consistent over time. And I think if anything, the past few months have seen an app take in the share of respondents who support um, the initiation of negotiations. Um, so again, although we assume that people have a stable opinion that is reflected across domains, I think we need to take into account that um, views on the invasion may vary. Now, I think there are other two trends in Russian public opinion that I'd like to, to draw your attention to. And these rely on surveys that we that were filtered um, in the summer of 2021, sorry, it shouldn't be 2001, 2021, and 2023. So uh, we were far slower to re-enter the field after the Russian um, invasion of Ukraine. That was uh, for a range of reasons, not least uh, funding restrictions to, imposed by different uh, research bodies on, on research uh, done in Russia. Um, nevertheless, in the summer of 2023, with funding from the UK Research Councils, we were able to uh, field a nationally representative survey of respondents, of Russian respondents, uh, with a sample mirroring that of Levada 1600, uh, in collaboration with Coltrix, which is a survey, online survey provider. And I think two trends that stood out for us are the following. First of all, there's been a differentiation in opinions depending on people's prior approval um, of the authorities. So what we've seen is that supporters of, of the Russian government or Vladimir Putin reported greater normative support for the authorities. So they became even more likely to say that um, you know, people should obey the law, they should follow the authorities, the authorities are right in dictating um, people's behaviors. Um, support um, for the same statement across the subset of respondents who did not support the authorities declined. And this is mirrored across surveys. Um, Levada shows a similar pattern if we subset to regime supporters and not. And I think divergence is quite striking in questions of whether uh, people think that 
Russians are afraid to express their true opinions to polls. According to Levada's most recent survey, for example, 75% per of those who oppose Putin say that, yes, Russians are afraid to report their opinions, as opposed to just 60% uh, of those who approve the Russian president. Another trend that I'd like to draw your attention to is this um, if you like hardening or, you know, escalation, radicalization of opinions among regime supporters when it comes to, um, you know, repressive or hostile measures against the opposition. And this, again, has implications for what we think the future may hold. So in both 2021 and 2023, um, we asked uh, Russian respondents how they think a range of uh, repressive or restrictive measures are. And on both occasions, we saw an increase of about 10 or sometimes 15 percent in the share of respondents who were willing to report that, you know, the authorities are justified in restricting protest or they are justified in arresting demonstrators and uh, opposition members um, who defy the law. This, again, is restricted among those who, rep who report support for the authorities. But I think it points to an interesting direction about how public opinion is moving and, and how it becomes, if you like, more polarized across uh, parties and lines. Um, I will conclude uh, the presentation um, with reference to, I think, what my fellow panelists also mentioned, which is the need to diversify the, the, the methods and the data we use in order to understand what people think about the war or whether they're willing to support it or not. Again, as part of, of, of this project, we have, um, in addition to collecting public opinion polls, which we will continue to do uh, for the next um, six months, um, we have been collecting data on um, protests, but also acts of resistance um, against the war. Um, and this plot shows how, how these events have uh, varied over time between January 2022 and February 2023. I think what's interesting also for studies of public opinion is to see the increase in acts of resistance um, at times of um, you know mobilization or, or around the time that the draft was announced by the Russian authorities. Um, women, mothers of soldiers, but also minorities who were affected by the, the draft and the invasion are at the forefront of, of such acts, acts of opposition to the war and the invasion. And I think this is a trend that's um, that we need to continue to study as we move on um, to the uh, presidential election of the spring. Um, I'm delighted that we'll hear more about the diversification of uh, methods to study our question. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Katrina. Again, re really compelling, super interesting uh, presentation. And now we move to our fourth and final panelist, uh, Maxim Alyukov, uh, who's an early career postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Russian and Euro East European Studies at the University of Manchester, research associate at King's Russia Institute at King's College London, also researcher with the Public Sociology uh, Laboratory. Uh, Maxim, welcome. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alex and Josh. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Do you, do you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, uh, just to diversify this uh, heavily survey-based panel a bit, I'll briefly talk about uh, a qualitative rather than a quantitative a uh, project focusing on, on the perceptions of the war uh, I've been involved in since the beginning of the invasion. Uh, I don't have much time, so I'll briefly focus on only some key uh, selected findings. So basically, uh, the project is run by, by a research team I belong to, which is called Public Sociology Laboratory, uh, in addition to Manchester and, and King's. And right after the beginning of the invasion, we uh, and a group of people who join us as scholars and interiors uh, started to conduct in-depth qualitative interviews with Russians, asking them about their emotions, perceptions of the war, media consumption, uh, issues like this. So the project is based on qualitative interviews. Uh, that is, uh, they were typically quite long, around 40 minutes on average, but could last for up to two hours. Uh, and hence, based on this data, I cannot really uh, say anything about a quantitative break breakdown of opinions uh, about the war in general, but uh, we can get a quite in-depth insight in how people actually reason when they uh, say that they support or do not support the war. 
Uh, yeah, we had uh, three waves, uh, basically three waves of the project, tracing how opinions have been changing for more than a year. The first wave started right after the beginning, like three days after the beginning of the invasion in uh, winter, spring 2022. Uh, and we <clears throat> interviewed people throughout the first months on the, on the invasion. Uh, and back then we focused on people who we classified as uh, supporters, opponents and people who uh, try to avoid giving any explicit assessment of, of the situation, we call them the undecided. Uh, and the second wave ha uh, happened last year, uh, and we focus on those who were then classified as non-opponents rather than supporters, and I will I explain why in the next uh, few minutes. And the third wave uh, third wave is still happening, uh, but we focus only on three regions, uh, Briatia, Svjotlovsk, Oblast, and Krasnodar Krai. And we've not processed uh, this data yet, but uh, you'll not see calls from, from this the third wave, but uh, the most patterns we identified before still apply to this new data. We can see them. Uh, so geographically, uh, here's our map of locations where we collected these interviews during the first wave. Uh, as you can see, it's not representative in any way, uh, focusing mostly on the western part of Russia uh, and on large cities. Uh, and uh, here's uh, the second wave. Uh, but it gives us a very sort of diverse set of reactions, which we can uh, delve into to see kind of rhetorical structures driving how people reason. Um, yeah, so I'll briefly describe the evolution of perceptions of the war uh, in one significant group, which led us to where we are now. Uh, it's important that it's just one trajectory among several. Uh, uh, there are people who are sort of strongly oppose the war or strongly support the war. Uh, but the most, uh, the very and most significant, uh, the largest group in our sample is people who sort of uh, have less clear uh, attitudes and perceptions. Uh, and this reasoning still characterizes uh, their thinking about the war now. So we discovered that after the, right after the beginning of the invasion, uh, the overwhelmingly popular reaction to the war was the one of shock. So uh, here are two quotes from people who we classified as non-opponents in the second wave, uh, reflecting on their first reaction late 2022. And the first interview says that uh, his war turned upside down uh, and he could not understand why people still wage wars. And the second one says that she was critical towards the invasion in the beginning, uh, hated Putin and even felt guilt. Uh, and the shock was followed by negative emotions, by anxiety, fear, uh, sometimes guilt. Um, and what was surprising in these first reactions is that uh, uh, they characterized not only those who opposed the war, but also uh, many of those who supported the war, uh, which uh, overlaps very much with what uh, Katerina was saying, right? So many of them did not support the war in the beginning, would not support the war uh, if given a choice. Uh, and for many who were critical of the invasion uh, in the beginning and did not have sort of clear opinion, this change in the first months of the inv invasion, we saw basically stabilization of attitudes and it happened in the following way. So uh, for many of these people who were politically disengaged, uh, they basically were forced to think about politics so much first time in their life. Uh, and they started searching for justifications for uh, for the war to cope with these negative emotions associated with, with the war itself, but also with the difference between how they thought about the war in general and uh, the fact that Russia was waging a very specific war against Ukraine now. Uh, so two more quotes. Uh, the second one says that the, she does not support the idea of military intervention in general, but this specific intervention probably had a cause which justified it. Uh, maybe there was no way for Russia but to attack. Maybe uh, there are reasons which led to the war which we do not know about. Uh, and the first one says that uh, any distant person is against the war, uh, but this conflict had a cause. In, uh, so the phrase any distant person is really illustrated here. We often encounter narratives like this. Uh, so what we discovered is that in interviews is that the tension between the fact that Russia is waging war and their perception of themselves as good civilized people who uh, cannot support the war by definition. Uh, and basically, in order to reconcile this negative attitudes toward the war in general and the fact that Russia is waging the war, uh, they started searching for some explanatory justifications to uh, basically maintain this positive self-image. Uh, and here is where propaganda comes in. So we. Uh, also see how uh, propaganda functions actually looking at these, uh, at these uh, justifications. So basically many turn to propaganda as a source of arguments, which complicates this idea of propaganda effects as something providing people with incorrect information. So throughout almost two years, we saw this cycle of increased attention to the news during key moments, uh, such as mobilization or the beginning of the invasion, and moments of fatigue and distancing. So they started actively following the news in early spring 2022, driven by fear, driven by anxiety, 
Then this attention led to fatigue and distancing in late uh, spring 2022. And then following mobilization uh, in fall 2022, uh, they started actively following the news again, driven by fear. Uh, and then late fee, uh, late fall 2022-2023, basically we see a return to this fight, fatigue and distancing again. So even key events during 2023, uh, such as Prigozhin's mutiny, did not change this pattern much. And uh, there are two interesting patterns of media consumption we observed. So while, uh, of course, there are those who trusted state media, uh, who reported trust in state media, uh, most perceived it with some kind of distrust, uh, even among regime supporters. And as a result of the distrust, many decided to disengage from the news at all at some point, which was quite common reaction. So the first quote, the respondent says that uh, she prefers to stick to the... Uh, uh, yes, yeah, he decided to disconnect from the majority of media outlets at all and simply remain, quote unquote, in the dark, uh, because there was this constant avalanche of biased information about the war, which requires a lot of uh, time to form an objective picture. And he did not have time. So therefore, the, he decided to basically disconnect from the news flow uh, at all. And then there were many people who uh, decided to stick to state media narratives despite being aware of bias. So the second quote demonstrates this very well. It's very illustrative. The respondent says that uh, he prefers to stick to government narratives because your brain needs to uh, some theory to cling to. So he's acutely aware of bias, right? So he understands that state propaganda is a theory. It's not a truth. It's not a fact. But uh, he prefers to, to stick to it. So basically, instead of simply giving them incorrect information about the war, propaganda became a useful source of arguments which allowed them to uh, cope with some traumatic experiences and resolve this tension between uh, negative attitudes towards the war in general and the fact that their country is waging a very specific war. Uh, so speaking about justifications, uh, we uh, <clears throat> were i trying to identify different justifications throughout 2022 and 2023. And we found very uh, several justifications and the way they sort of use them combining in different ways. So some of them come from personal experience and culture, and some of them come from propaganda. So one popular narrative last year was normalization, basically the idea that uh, they justified the invasion by saying that the war is normal, right? So uh, there is always a war going on somewhere, uh, so nothing to worry about. Uh, then there was a narrative justification we classified as, nih as nihilism. Basically, the idea that this is how everyone acts. You have to lower your expectations uh, and give up some moral ideals because people are not sort of moral creatures. They tend to be cruel and violent and wage wars. Uh, and then there was the narrative of resignation. At, as it has already happened, uh, there's no way of affect, uh, for you to affect it in a uh, country like Russia, which is an authoritarian environment. So again, nothing to worry about. And then there were, uh, we saw a couple of new justification emerging in late 2022, which still continue to be relevant. One was the narrative of natural disaster. So uh, there is no way to oppose a natural disaster such as a hurricane, right? Because uh, it's unstoppable. It's a force of nature. Uh, and uh, uh, Russia's war on Ukraine is a similar uh, phenomenon. So you can't stop a hurricane. Therefore, you uh, there's no way to oppose the war. Uh, and then we saw the emergence of an uh, interesting category of uh, reverse justifications. Uh, basically, the, consequence, the consequences of the war are seen as causes of the war. So, for instance, the cruelty of Ukrainian soldiers towards Russian soldiers uh, is presented as a justification for the war, although clearly uh, the latter is the cause for the former, right? So they basically reverse the order trying to uh, uh, justify the war. Uh, so to conclude, so to sum up, uh, Speaking about this category we worked on, uh, I don't think that the concept of support accurately describes what they've been experiencing and what we're seeing today. So the concept of support comes from democratic environments where uh, we assume that citizens support policies or governments based on some uh, preferences, right? So the idea is very much influenced by economic approaches and political science, assuming that we uh, make choices based on preferences and information. Uh, and in the context of political disengagement within the group, uh, the group observe, uh, justification seems to be a more accurate concept. So what we observe is better captured by what uh, social psychologists will call would call uh, social justification. Basically, individuals tend to justify status quo when they lack agency and they have to cope with something they do not like, right? Or when they perceive threat. 
uh, and uh, main patterns in attitudes towards the war that we observe today in this uh, interviews. First of all, instead of consistency we would associate with support, we see this mix of criticism and justifications. And probably when being approached by a pollster uh, and asked directly, do you support the war? They would sample one specific consideration out of this mix of consideration uh, considerations and say yes, right? But uh, this does not really reflect uh, inconsistencies in these responses, at least based on the interviews uh, we see. Uh, instead of enthusiasm, we would associate with support. We see a lot of anxiety still, so many try to disconnect themselves from the war uh, to worry less, right? But we still see a lot of anxiety and. Uh, vision of victory of future they rather fear defeat so the idea is that uh, it, <clears throat> a defeat will bring political and economic disaster therefore we have to stick to government narrative not because we want uh, the war to because we want victory uh yeah and uh most of them will say that they want the war to end but on russia's conditions right so in order to avoid this catastrophe and the lion's share of them would prefer to keep crimea uh, many would prefer to keep Donbass, although it's much less, uh, much more equivalent. And some would prefer to keep newly annexed territories, but it's not that important as many do not really understand why they were annexed in the first place. Uh, yeah, and uh, I think that it's mostly consistent with some of the work done by uh, different organizations trying to identify different clusters, such as, for instance, the Russian Filter Chronicles. Uh, where they report the decrease in the number of active supporters, those who have consistent uh, opinions and positions, and they report an increase in people who would uh, sort of uh, want peace on Russia's on different conditions, uh, yeah, which uh, increased. Uh, but it's important to understand is that based on, at least based on what we see, uh, it's, this picture is not stable. So, given that these attitudes are fluid. And they are not characterized by active support. I think these perceptions would change uh, depending on conditions, and of course, depending on the government's agenda. So, if there is a sort of consistent narrative saying that we should end the war, it would change quickly. Uh, yeah. So, if you want to know more, get a better better sense of how they reason, the Institute for European and Russian and Eurasian Studies at the George Washington University uh, kindly translated this report, the recent report, and published it. Uh, so it's based on the second wave of, of data, which means last year, but this pattern still uh, characterize what we see today. So it might be interesting. Great. Thank, thank you thank so much. You, yeah, thank you so much, Maxime. Uh, and thanks to all the panelists. This has been this has been super interesting getting all this information at once. And I and I like the way the different studies complement each other. Um, we're going to go to Q&A now. So if you have questions and you haven't put them in the Q&A, please go ahead and do so. Uh, I'm going to try to bundle a couple, a bunch of them together on the methods subject, and we'll probably maybe get one methods question out there, and then we'll move on to some more substantive oriented questions. Uh, I think the the one question that uh, that there seems to be interest in is, you know, and I think it was great, Tim. I really like that you guys, your project, you guys were trying to get at some of these methodological questions. But Grigo, given this huge amount of data that you guys have collected here with the Russia Watcher survey, I think the question that a number of people are wondering is. How do we, you know, who are these people who are answering these surveys? And you, you, the results really track so closely with the omnibus surveys that uh, that Katarina shows us, and the and the and the and the, and the and the panel survey that Tim shows us. So, like, why are we confident that these kind of like? Can you tell us a little bit more about how you're sampling people here? We can go into the weeds just a little bit, just for a little bit here. But why, and, and Russia Watcher, it's this incredible resource for those of you who haven't checked it out, but why we should be trusting this thing, this particular way of going about and getting people. And I know you guys have dived into the, the questions of the methods and how it's doing. And so how, how do you think that this method that you're using, if you can tell us a little bit more about it and why it's clearly not a representative method, but why does it seem to be, do you think, approximating representative samples here? Yeah, thanks so much. I mean, so, so you know what what representative means at this uh, at this point is uh, is is quite tricky, right? And so we actually ran some surveys uh, with Qualtrics uh, in the summer of 2022 as well. We have been doing these surveys before, and I we found that actually uh, uh, the. the the Polfish uh, method, the RDE stuff that we're using was giving us sort of 
demographic better demographic distribution of uh, of respondents than, than Qualtrics was. Uh, now that being said, this is all they're they're online, right? So from that perspective, you're not going to get the 15% of Russians who do not have internet access, and then there are others who may have internet access but may not be able to sort of navigate this stuff. Uh, but beyond that, what we, we've been we've been sort of pleasantly surprised at uh, at the extent to which both in terms of the distribution of ages, right? With Qualtrics, there was a, always a problem with getting sort of people who are about 55 or 60 years old. We get more of those in uh, with, with with these samples than with uh, with others because probably because of the range of uh, of apps and uh, websites uh, the, 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 that they that they use. And then as far I mean, you know, ultimately. Uh, so the way this works is that they get a they get an ad that says if you want a free recipe or a free article or whatever take this survey, and if they click on this, they then get our uh, confidentiality our consent form which tells them what it's about, right? And then they have the option to opt to opt in or opt out obviously uh, for this. Uh, I don't know if I uh, could I share my screen for a second just to show you a couple of things. Um, so sure. There are a couple of things that I, that I think might be uh, worth looking at uh, here. So one of them is we asked them at some point, we asked them a question about how, and this address is one of the questions that came up in the Q&A as well, as to why we should believe this stuff at all and how risky is it uh, to answer these questions. So we asked people, how risky is it to, to oppose the special military operation in different types of contexts? One of them is conversations at work, which is the left uh, most uh, uh, bar here. Then it's conversations with friends, and then it's surveys face to face, surveys over the phone, and then in black is surveys online, right? And what we see, which is not that surprising, is that you know people are much more comfortable talking to their friends than talking to others, even though, but even there, they, they don't think that they're completely uh, safe. But what we do find is that the online surveys, the concerns about the risks are lower than for the other two types of first surveys, which makes a fair bit of sense, right? Because you're there by yourself. It's a, it's an anonymous, uh, you don't have somebody showing up or calling your number, which means that they know your number and so on. And so, so I think that's, that's sort of one. The other thing that we did, which we worried about is we asked uh, people uh, about who they thought ran the survey. Uh, and as you can see from here, I don't know how well it's uh, visible on the screen, only 6% thought it was the Russian government. Uh, and uh, it's evenly split between thinking that it's a foreign, uh, that it's a foreign uh, or, or Russians. Lots of people thought that they didn't know, but, but this is not, so, so the perceptions here now, it's possible that people who think that everything is, that everything is uh, uh, run by the government would not even click into this. Uh, but what's interesting there is that here we have the, the proportions of consent form refusals. So these are the people who are, go from being told, can you take a survey without being told what it is, to then clicking through and actually taking a survey that tells them that it's going to be about uh, politics and about uh, the SMO and so on. And what we see is a slight decline over uh, uh, in the proportion of people who are willing to take the survey, but it goes from you know 99% to about 93%. Right. So this does not this does not look like people who are who are sort of particularly uh, worried. And in line with this, and this is uh, you know uh, we have this this separate paper, and here is just a, a sort of quick graph from that, which traces this uh, the differences between direct questions and list experiments over time. And what we find is that there is some increase in the in the difference between what people tell you directly about the support for the war versus the proportion that comes from uh, from the list experiments. But in additional uh, analysis, and I can you know we don't have time quite uh, uh, entirely, is we find that most of this is not preference falsification but weak preferences, right? So this is not that people are afraid. So we're basically crossing the direct responses with the extent to which people are worried about. Uh, answering uh, surveys. And so much of this, and I think this goes a little bit to Maxime's qu question as well, right? If, you, if given this sort of uh, uh, question of yes, do you support or no, do you not support? If you're, if you're very much in this sort of mushy middle, the way you answer these questions is gonna matter a lot as a function of wording and so on. And that brings me to the final point, which is somebody asked a question about the difference between uh, Russia Watcher and Russian Field. So here we compare the responses to the support for the war for Russia, Russia Watch and Russian Field, uh, for the at the time when the Russian Field was in uh, in uh, was surveyed, this was in 2022, and what we find is that the proportions are quite similar 
there's uh, you know if you if you sort of comp there, we have a slightly higher level of, of strong support but slightly lower levels of, uh, of of weak support the overall levels of support are not that uh, different so a lot of the differences that i think we see and the problem is that that i think a lot of the the way these things then get reported in the media is people will say Russians don't support a war. Why? Because they say that they want peace. It's like, well, but, you know, they want peace on certain types of uh, uh, conditions and grounds. And so we have to be very, very careful about how we word this question and then how we compare across different types of wording. I think that that's actually a bigger difference than the differences in mode of, uh, of, of surveying. Okay. All right. Thanks, Grigo. Let me ask to the other three panelists. There's a bunch of different questions that are that are in the Q&A that are all basically getting at the point of like, do we have options beyond surveys, right? So one of the questions that came in is about trying to talk, uh, you know, talking with uh, networks of, of, you know, networks, people in our own networks uh, that we may know from prior contact. Um, another of the questions was about trying to look at objective indicators, like purchasing goods to support uh, people who are in the armies and stuff like that. So for those of you, you know, and I'm, and I know that this is, you know, maybe this is more at Maxime, but like in addition to the in-depth interviews that you've done, Maxime, have you thought about this? Have you, have any of you engaged in any activities? Are you aware of other people or, or are we basically in a world where we have these in-depth interviews of the nature that Maxime is doing and the polling that we're doing and just, and our best guess is, is trying to get a handle on the polling. Are there other things out, other possibilities out there? Tim, you uh, at, or Maxime, you want to start? Okay. Just, oh, uh, just just few words. Yeah, well, there, there are many qualitative studies, like based on ethnography, on focus, focus groups, stuff like this. But uh, of course, you can't really, you know, have a qualitative data, which is experimentally valid and representative. So there is an issue here. And uh, I have not seen like so, some attempts to... Like there are methods in history of political science, like for instance, you know, when you come back and read classics like John Zeller, who uh, try to study these inconsistencies in different con considerations people sample when they respond. But I have not seen sort of attempts to combine, uh, to bring these methodologies together and design uh, sort of more sophisticated uh, surveys which would reflect these this inconsistencies. So it's a great sort of task for the future. And for, for, the, for this reason, I'm also quite skeptical about the idea of preference falsification, which is, uh, just was discussed here, right? Because uh, preference falsification implies that you have preferences, right? Which is a uh, function of your political engagement. So that's a, a question I, would, I, I wanted to ask uh, Tim and others. So uh, how about uh, looking at uh, disaggregating data, looking at different sort of patterns, depending on political engagement? So for, uh... Tim? Yeah, a few points. Um... <clears throat> And Tim, you can also feel if you if you want to address some of the more specific questions. Yeah. That too, but... No, sure, sure. <clears throat> but uh, just to speak to this question of trying to get qualitative information from elites uh, who might have more influence on events, I think that's a great idea. Um, I don't know if if I call up uh, uh, you know Prime Minister Mishustin today whether he'll he'll answer my call, um, but you know. I also talk with a lot of people who talk with a lot of uh, influencers in Russia, and it's often as uh, you're really relying on people accurately conveying information in a setting where the influencers have great incentive to try to spin their subjects. So when, you know, we often hear people who are engaging with lots of elite Russians saying, oh, how they're not supportive of the war, how they feel really terrible and how they feel really guilty about it. And that may be sincere, but it also may be just an attempt to try to save their reputation. So it, it's valuable, but it really has to be treated with caution. Um, other kinds of objective indicators, you know, you can look at prices on goods of, uh, uh, that might be affected uh, by the war, people's willingness to make long-term purchases, uh, birth rates, um, uh, decisions to get married, these kinds of generally uh, very lumpy uh, long-term decisions uh, 
might be a plan their um, uh, their lives ahead. So to the extent that we see changes in those kinds of indicators before and after the war, we might be able uh, to get some purchases uh, on that question. And yeah, I agree with, with Maxim on um, preference falsification. I think these are really difficult questions to answer, um, you know, and to reduce them to a binary of do you support or not support the war is clean and helpful and it does force respondents to make a decision, but without a whole battery of other kinds of questions and looking at the kinds of groups um, that are answering questions in certain ways, we're really getting a very, very narrow uh, uh, picture. So that's why I think it is really important to have questions that force respondents to make choices, but also have questions that allow them to display some of the subtleties of their responses in both the survey setting and in a more qualitative, deep interviewing uh, context as well. So, Katrina, did you want to weigh in on the methodological point? In, on, the, on the methodological point, but also on, on some of the other the questions Please. that have been raised, I think um, the question of whether Russians have, you know, consistent views on the war is a very interesting one, as is the question of uh, of their views, you know, of where these views come from, and whether they're the result of political engagement or instead, you know, the the result of of socialization and information consumption, which is not restricted only, you know, on on TV, but also at school. I think um, the panelists, the audience will know, since the invasion of Ukraine, there has been a, um, a wide ranging reform of uh, education in Russia. The books have changed. The curriculum has been reformed, and I think that's. Um, as an important development to take note of um, the authorities' ability also to shape, um, you know, social discourse in people's localities, neighborhoods, and elsewhere also matters, precisely because it helps sustain this image of, uh, you know, widespread support for what the authorities think and where we're going. Um, but I think. It, Again, you know, the intensity of preferences and their consistency is something worth um, studying even um, further. I think an interesting um, extension that I think is is, is more feasible in, in an online setting is also, you know, asking people to justify opinions, so perspective uh, taking, but also justification um, giving. And, and I think, you know, as, as challenging as it has been to pivot online um, as a result of the invasion, uh, there's a, a wealth of possibilities that have opened up, then I think we should uh, explore it comparatively uh, across surveillance. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, so my question actually draws upon this report about U.S. intelligence assessment that came out yesterday, hit the wires, um, that there have been about 315,000 casualties, about 87, 88% of the initial Russian force. And I do think in Western commentary, there was this an analysis, there was this tendency to think that high casualty rates would inevitably at some point catch up with public opinion, right? And, and influence sentiment, attitudes, if not maybe directly for the support of military operations, certainly like anxiety, right? About how they feel and how they perceive things going. So I'd be really interested, some of you have already addressed this both explicitly and implicitly, in terms of your own research approaches how would you, if you were asked to give commentary in that kind of Reuters article yesterday, how would you have weighed in on this, this link between casualties and support for the war? Is it about information not getting um, to the Russian public? Or are there all these other things going on that uh, that mediate the impact of, 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 of casualties on, on their sentiment? And whoever wants to take this, please, I, Gregorian. Yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, th I think that that's a that's a very interesting question because it is somewhat puzzling that we see no difference between people who know somebody who's died or not. And I think a lot of this is about the framing, right? The uh, the, the Kremlin has very successfully framed this as a, as a sort of parallel to the Great Patriotic War and so on, and fighting Nazis, right? And the problem is that when you're fighting Nazis, people are going to die. But just because people die fighting Nazis doesn't mean that you should support continue doing it. 
right? And and we we actually this is a, uh, we ran a, uh, an experiment at some point where we tried to sort of see whether we could change people's perceptions of how many people had uh, died. And the problem is that when people were sort of when we could manipulate that a little bit, but doing that actually made them more likely to think that the Ukrainians it was the Ukrainians' fault and uh, and uh, and so on, right? So it's very hard to overcome that kind of a frame. Uh, and without that, it's gonna. I, I don't think that incremental changes in in this are gonna make that that much of a difference. So the question is where that alternative frame is gonna come from. Certainly not from the West. Yeah, very interesting. Others on this? Um, yeah, if, if if I can. Um, so looking at um, data on acts of resistance or protest or silent opposi you know, symbolic opposition to the war since the, the, the war, the invasion was launched. We have seen that the mothers and wives and relatives of those, you know, worse affected by the draft and the invasion have been, you know, opposing developments on the ground. We have seen, um, you know, wives and mothers trying to um, organize protest outside of uh, draft centers, uh, uh, blocking roads. Um, and, and these events have been, you know, mainly in Russia's ethnic republics. The regime has been very strategic in terms of where it would, you know, select um, the people it sent to, to, to the front. I think Though an interesting dimension is that even in those cases, um, looking at reports of what these people say and what they do when they participate, they don't oppose the word per se in invasion as such, but they do oppose the mobilization. And I think that's an interesting uh, uh, question by and of itself. Part of it, you know, as Gregor says, is also about how it is framed this heroic act to, you know, um, participate in, in the words that the motherland um, engages. But but I think that it, it would not be fair to say that there has been no resistant, uh, resistance because it would be denying the, the experience and the behavior of these populations. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, Tim, do you have thoughts on this? Yes, yeah, sure. I, I did uh, an article, I think it was in Politico, uh, about six or seven months ago, looking at what we know about casualty rates and public opinion in the U.S. and setting, trying to make sense of that for um, for Russia. And you know, two of the important considerations were that uh, Americans were willing to tolerate high levels of casualty as long as they thought uh, the U.S. was winning. Um, and when it uh, uh, in numerous wars, when it looked like things were uh, not going very well, um, people responded far more strongly to increases in casualties um, than when things were going well. Um, the other important consideration is whether or not they thought the decision to begin the war was right, whether that was actually the correct decision. Um, and on those two fronts, um, you know, Grigo's data suggests that people think the war is going OK, um, hardly, hardly a great success, but far from a great uh, failure. And if we look at data on whether or not it was the, the right um, th the thing to do, we asked a question in our survey um, looking, I'm, I'm, I'll paraphrase, so, so don't quote me on this. Uh, Looking back, um, uh, you know, if you had to do it over again, basically, in February 2023, what should the Russian government have done? Uh, most people thought uh, 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 only 25 percent um, said that they that, that they should have sent in the troops. Other responses that were kind of more common were keep the status quo or look for a, look for a peaceful solution. So, you know, the state has great ability to control information and sway propaganda to influence people's perceptions about whether it was the right thing to do to start the war or whether the, the war is going well or badly. Um, but it does seem to, to, to me that over time that, that, that this could be a drain on, uh, on support for the war. Okay. Um, thanks so much for those answers. I want to I, I, we, we have time for one more question at this point, and there's a bunch of different questions in the in the in the in the chat, which I think all kind of get at the depth of support question, uh, which can also be sort of phrased as the like, so what on public opinion question. So and we have this one person who's an anonymous attendee who's asking this question and notes that it's kind of telling that that this person is sending it anonymously because they're a Russian living in Moscow right now. So my question is. And I would be interested in, I want to start with Maxime, but I would be interested in concise answers from all of you here, is this kind of combo depth question and so what question, which is 
all right, so we see these consistently strong support for the war findings over time, not really reaction reacting to that much. But then tucked in here, like Grigo, you mentioned something about like the 25% of weekly support, and we're not sure what that means. And Tim, you had this super telling finding about like, okay, but if you go to general mobilization, bam, 75% say they oppose it. And then uh, Katerina, you had earlier, like right before the war, like only 10% were saying they support it. So I would be interested as a kind of closing thought, A, do we think that this support, despite being stable in a kind of time series stability, public opinion type way, is it stable in a kind of depth of stability? And if you have speculation about what it would take to sort of undermine this, we've heard, you know, I've seen this, we've, we've heard something about inflation. We've seen the statistic about, uh, saw the statistic about general mobilization. Are these things really threats or, or have we, you know, seen this film before? And Maxime, maybe I'll start with you with the in-depth, with having done, you know, looked at this, what you're finding in the in-depth interviews here. Yeah, and asking everyone for one minute answers because we're almost at time. Uh, that's a very difficult question to answer in one minute. So you can yeah, have, I you think because that... you didn't get on the last round. So you can go longer and then everyone else has got to go one minute. Uh, yeah, I think what uh, we think about when we think about uh, so what question and surveys, uh, we typically I, I, people ask whether you know, Russians will protest against Putin at some point and whether we can measure it in, in surveys. And uh, I, I, I'm kind of skeptical about this idea uh, of using surveys to predict change because uh, there is this whole separate uh, field, which is called social movement studies, where people have been consistently, repeatedly questioning this idea of attitudes leading to protests for decades, right? So they say that organizations matter, uh, political opportunities matter, networks matter. So uh, yeah, uh, I'm also struggling with this sort of idea of so what and, and, and survey questions, because I think surveys are very useful for sort of uh, inferring some patterns, um, building theories. But in terms of predicting changes, like whether people will protest, you can't really rely on service to predict it. Uh, neither interviews are useful in this respect. Uh, yeah, it does not directly address your question, but. Great. Others along with final thoughts? Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I think that that is important. And I think one of the things, you know, between these, whether this is 65% or whatever, whatever percentage uh, say that they support the war, much of the action is not really in these uh, numbers, right? A lot of the action, the people who protest are almost always a small proportion of the population, right? And so from that perspective, that kind of intensity that uh, Katerina talked about as well, right, For from certain types of people, that could matter a lot. Uh, on this question of whether we can use the surveys to predict uh, uh, protest, uh, uh, Graham Robertson and I did this survey in uh, Ukraine before the Euromaidan, about a year before, and we asked people if there was another revolution, would you pro would you go protest or not? Uh, and then a year and a half later, after the Euromaidan, we actually went back and sort of asked them who had protested or not. And to our surprise, it, it was actually quite strongly predictive what they said two and a half years earlier. Now. It may be that they're all lying the first time and lying the second time, but but the the overall patterns are not are, are are pretty strong. So I think in that sense, at least for a relatively small proportion of people, this may be predictive. And the question is whether we're good about picking out some of these uh, so, some of these nuclei of, of of potential resistance. Right. Thank you, uh, Katerina. Do you have a last word and thought on this? Yeah, I think um, a key question is not uh, that also answers to how stable support is, is where does support come from, right? Is it the result of socialization? Is it the result of ideology? Or does it rely, uh, rely on perceptions of support? Because if the latter, if people, you know, just uh, have weak preferences, they're easier to change and, and they will ebb and, and the flow. Uh, perceptions of unanimity are easy to break down. And I think this has implications for how we think about the stability, uh, both over time, uh, but also um, when developments on the ground change. All right, thank you. Tim. Uh, yeah, very quickly. Uh, yes, we find very little support for a general mobilization, but we should also note that that's the Kremlin's policy right now. If there was a big Kremlin campaign to try to sell why a mobilization was needed, we might find uh, more support for it. We also asked a question that tried to get at a trade-off where we said, sometimes governments have to finance war, sometimes they have to increase social spending. You know, what do you think the Russian government should do 
And we found that, you know, more people were willing to say that they should finance defense over social spending, which I, I thought was a little bit um, uh, surprising. Uh, finally, um, I had one colleague who tried to characterize his view of Russian's view, which was, uh, and this is a joke, he said that, uh, you know, having started the war, we have to fight till the bitter end, but just don't ask me to do anything. He, he thought that was the, uh, uh, you know, kind of wi widespread uh, point of view where we want to win, but we really want somebody else to really bear the cost. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. So thank you all for a really super interesting and very relevant, timely session. Um, we hope you will join us again sometime soon. Just a reminder that our next RPP is January 31st um, and that we cannot do this without the support of our wonderful postdoc Anton, of Eileen and Alexandra at Harriman uh, and the Jordan Center, thank you. So once again, thank you, Katerina, for joining. Thank you, Grigori. Thank you, Maxime. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Josh. See you all very soon. Happy holiday season, everyone. Thanks a lot. Happy holidays. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.